Good evening, everybody. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us on HUR at Home Inspiration. I'm Jackie Gales Webb. I hope you had a wonderful service today, a great day wherever you are, wherever you are watching us. I know that God blessed you in a mighty way. I'm depending on it and I'm claiming it. As we go about our daily lives, uh, over 10 million coronavirus cases have been confirmed worldwide. Several states are proceeding with their phased openings. Here in the DMV, some churches and stores have been opening. African-American families have been gathering here in DC this weekend to celebrate our culture. Many were out to participate in debates around the Emancipation Memorial statue in Washington's Lincoln Park. While most of us are just trying to safely carry on with our lives, please, please be safe. Do not be afraid or ashamed to tell someone that they are standing too close. And if you're in a situation where you don't feel safe, where there are others who are not acting appropriately, if you tell them that you feel uncomfortable and they don't do anything and it doesn't matter to them, please leave. Just leave. Just go. It's your life. It's your family's life that we're talking about. Did you see that story about the Starbucks employee who told the woman at Starbucks it was their policy, you must wear a mask in the establishment? The woman got mad. She uh, recorded the employee on her phone and posted it, uh, a horrible post on Facebook denouncing the employee for demanding that she wear a mask. Much to her surprise, it backfired on her. There were so many people on her post that was in favor of the employee. And as a matter of fact, they raised over $32,000 to give that employee a tip. <laughs> More good news, the United States House of Representatives voted in favor of DC statehood on Friday, uh, 232 to 180. And some more good news, the Howard Gospel Choir of Howard University was one of the feature performers during the rebroadcast of the television special, Taking the Stage, African-American Music and Stories that Changed America. This was the program that happened right before the launching of the Smithsonian National Museum of African-American History and Culture. And if you missed it, you can see it on Hulu. And, as, and speaking of, um, uh, cable or on-demand things, um, Hamilton, the musical is going to be coming out on Disney Plus July 3rd. I actually saw it at the Kennedy Center here with the touring cast, so I'm really interested in seeing the original Broadway cast, although I really didn't want to subscribe to another streaming service, but I did. <laughs> um, and speaking of music, musicals and music and choirs and gospel music in our Second segment of HUR at Home Inspiration, we'll talk with Dr. Ricky Dillard, Grammy and Stellar Award nominated artist and choir director extraordinaire. Uh, he's been ministering to us for many years and it's gonna be a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to talk with him. Right now, it's my honor and pleasure to welcome Mia K. Wright, co-pastor and executive director of the Fountain of Praise in Houston, Texas. Pastor Wright, welcome. Oh, hello, is my mic on? Just want to make sure. You're good, we can hear you. Oh, and now we can't hear you for some odd uh, reason. Okay, there we go. I hate when that happens. Am I good? <laughs> I said, yeah, we're getting there. Thank you for having me on. Uh, her at home, what a blessing it is. I was just thinking about how the technology works so that we can really communicate and reach people just where they are. Yes, thank God for the technology. 
And thank God for you. The last time all of us here on this streaming service saw you was at George Floyd's funeral that was held at your church. You and your husband presided so beautifully over that service. What was it like to be in the middle of the spotlight that, that put you in? It was an international spotlight. People were watching all over the world. You know, it was tremendous because our goal as a ministry, as as people of faith and as a church body is really to minister to people, especially in times of need. And so, as many of you may have heard, uh, one of George Floyd's cousins, you know, some of our families, we don't grow up with cousins. Our cousins are, are tight like brothers and sisters. And so um, she's one of the members of our church, a very active member. And when she reached out to ask about hosting the funeral, it was just a man who had been murdered funeral. It was not a man who was sparking a whole global revolution of let's really connect what's happening in the world. Let's connect what's happening systemically to black people. Let's connect what's happening to our uh, with policing and other forms of racism. It wasn't this big movement. It was just another man who had been killed. And so the eyes of the world were upon us for sure. And during a time that COVID had hit. <laughs> and so, you know, being able to host the services, it was a lot of behind the scenes work to, to really be able to provide a safe and secure environment for people to be able to grieve and to uh, honor this man's life who was sadly sacrificed. Um, and and I, I don't mean to say sacrifice in a way that, you know, would make well, it was sacrificed for this cause that we we hear right now. I really think that God is very intentional in the things that he does in his timing. How is the family member who's a church member and how is the family doing of George Floyd? Um, I've spoken with her several times. They are still processing. You know, it's it's interesting when you go through grief and it's a very public setting because there is a microphone, there's a camera, there is somebody always looking and posting and talking and interpreting your pain. And so now for all of them, they've had a moment to really take a step back and to process and to start to process. They've lost somebody that they love, someone who was, you know, a big, big part of their family, someone who was whose uh, whose life was intricately woven into all of their lives. And so they're processing it and it will take time. No one can put uh, a day or a month or or how long a time period it will take for someone to overcome their grief. So they're processing it. And so and the good thing about it is that they're processing it properly. They're, they're turning their pain into purpose. You're right there in Texas and we just celebrated Juneteenth, a situation mm -hmm. where people all over the world were just now learning what African-Americans knew all along about Juneteenth. What was June like in Houston, Texas? You know, uh, amidst all the circumstances of COVID, I think it was still just celebratory for many people. I can speak personally for myself. I was raised in Austin, Texas, and Juneteenth was a very big part of our family. It was a time that all of our extended family, we all came together and have a very, very large family. Um, one of my great grandfathers owned property right after Emancipation Proclamation. And so we every year would go back to that site. We would hear the stories of the ancestors. We would hear the pain, the struggles that they went through, not just in slavery, but also through reconstruction periods, um, through Jim Crow laws. And so it was a part of, for my family, it was a way that we learned about our history and we learned to celebrate that. Well, I must admit that when I moved into Houston, that it was not as much a part of the fabric of what I did on Juneteenth any longer. And mostly because um, there were no really formal celebrations or there were not a lot of things that would happen. And so my children didn't grow up with the same uh, benefit of learning what Juneteenth was. To me, they did not grow up with that same uh, knowledge. But this year, it became so important that I sat and I talked with my children. We talked about what Juneteenth really meant. We talked about um, how the slaves were, you know, uh, got a, had another year and a half, almost two years of free labor, how the slave owners received extra labor because the word did not come to Texas because Texas was still in crop producing season. So, um, so I think for a lot of people, it was enlightening. It was good. It was, it was being able to connect our history once again and say, wake up, especially in my generation, wake up and make sure that our children know our history. 
because if they're not teaching it in the school districts, then guess where the history has to come from? It has to come through those families that are telling and retelling their stories. Well, thank God uh, for you and all that you do in Houston. I tuned in this morning to the live stream and I saw a wonderful sermon by your son. Tell us about your family and tell us about your son because he talked about uh, some trials and tribulations that he went through and that you, you all recently had a tragedy in your family. Yes, you know, unfortunately, as is going forth in many places in our country and some of the inner cities, there's so much black on black crime. And so we have experienced that happening once again. Um, my husband's oldest, uh, well, not our eldest daughter, but it's one of his older children from his first marriage was tragically murdered in 1997. She was mother to a toddler at that time. Her son mm -hmm. now, who was, who was a young adult, was murdered on Friday morning in the same city, in the same manner in which she was murdered. And so to see this history repeat in our family is really heart-wrenching. To see it repeat is tragic in the sense that, you know, no family should have to go through this one time, but to experience the same pain twice is really difficult. And so I'm proud of my, my oldest boy. He was able to stand today and preach his very first sermon. He is, he's been in ministry for a few years, but this was his first sermon in front of the, well, in front of the congregation and the congregation being online now. So it was the first time for him to really be able to present in that manner. A lot of people saw the maturity of a young man who has, you know, he, he's, he struggled through a few things, you know, he much like a lot of kids in school, he was an intelligent student, but just never really had uh, the right teacher to help him with, to process some things. And so, um, you know, like many kids, he was a little bit wayward for a little while, thank God, but he's always been the obedient kid. I always say, you know, this one, he, he was, I never had to, you know, discipline him for being disobedient in that sense, but he just had his own little world that he was living towards. But what was in him eventually came out because God will never allow the purposes that he puts in your life to die out. If it's your purpose that God has gifted and called you to have, then that is what God will intend. There's a scripture that says, uh, "Plans the plans of man may be many, but it's God's purposes that will prevail. And so it just, I just thought about that all day today and how he is walking and fulfilling his calling. He is doing what he has been destined to do. It's in his DNA, it's who he is. And it's been there since birth. And we could see it as a kid. Um, <laughs> he leads our young adults and I feel like I'm just talking a lot. I'm sorry, but he leads our young adults ministry. We always say, we always call him the Pied Piper of kids and Pied Piper of his friends. So to see this young man now at 30, 33, I think is to see him come back in the church, to see him come into his, his purpose and calling and to see all of his friends now come back to church because they see him in his calling is what right. is a blessing. So I tell parents, don't give up on your kids. Don't give up on your kids. Keep praying for them. Keep believing in them and keep encouraging them so that they will fulfill their purpose. They definitely need encouragement. Um, I know you were so proud of him. I was proud of him for you. Um, but I, I'm concerned about our young people. I, I think back to when, you know, many moons ago when I was young and I was worried about uh, nuclear war, that Ru the Russians were going to drop a bomb. Mm. We have young people now that are afraid of being stopped by the police or being murdered by other neighbors. Mm. You know, how can we, what can we do to ease the emotional tension that our young people are feeling, so a lot of them are just afraid right now. Yeah. You know, this generation has to have dealt with some stuff that we would never have dealt with. You know, I'm, I'm like you, we were, were, you know, doing drills in school for bombs when we were kids, but these kids, they could have active shooters show up on their campus at any day. You know, a parent like myself, I have three sons, you know, doesn't matter what their credentials are, doesn't matter where they've been to school. When an officer of the law stops them, they see a black man in a car and uh, they see a potential threat. And so for these young people, you know, many of them, you know, in the past, I don't think we thought about it as much, right? And so when my kids were younger and they were just learning to drive, 
we started to really get nervous about that with these these children. You know, what if they're out late? What if they're out too late? And so I just for for parents, I say, you know, part of it is going to have to be our trust and our faith in the Lord. But every African American, every person, whether you're brown, black, white, needs to be educated. That's the first thing I would say. Educate yourself to what is going on so that you know your rights, so that you know what to do if you're stopped by the law, so that you can be safe, so that you can, you know, be respectful, but also know who you are and know your rights. That is so important. But I think in terms of the anxiety that many people are sensing and feeling, part of it, you know, is prayer. And, and you know, I, I, I get shocked sometimes when people say, yeah, people say, you know, my thoughts and my prayers are with you or have your thoughts and your prayers. You know, so we have to do more than just pray because the Bible tells us that faith without works is dead. So we have to be able to take what we know. We take that knowledge that God has given us, but that that knowledge that we've also prepared ourselves with into some type of action so that we are motivated to do more than just have knowledge and motivated to do more than just pray. So we become very active participants of our future, active participants into the system of what where we're living and, and what's happening. Um, and I'll just say this to say that we had a circumstance in my neighborhood where one of my neighbors, um, we have a new neighbor. A lot of people were wondering, why well, is this young guy with these cars and this and this? And so, of course, then the email situation comes out. And when that email hit and somebody said, maybe drugs, you know, I was like, whoa, hey, wait a minute, neighbors. And I called it out because in the past, I probably have been like, ah, I'm just going to let this go. You know, I'm not going to challenge somebody's mindset. But no, I said, no, I'm going to call it out because we have people who are dead today because of good neighbor policies, right? Because people are trying to do what they feel is right in their neighborhood. And I explained to one of my neighbors who was really offended by my response. I said, your car house and my house have most cars. I would hate to think that the people drive to your house and the rest of the neighbors think that, oh, those are friends and family. And then uh, my, my sons come, come to my house and they think, oh, they must be drug dealers. So you know, we need to be aware of that and see when we see it, act on it, you know, because God gives us wisdom, but he also gives us the ability to act and to respond. And so no longer are we, uh, I like what um, Al Sharpton said during the funeral, <laughs> you're not uh, punks in the pulpit. <laughs> I, I got so tickled by that because I was like, that's right. We're not punks in the pulpit. We really have to be moved to some type of action and every person is responsible for that action. And that action should be respectful, should be within the bounds of the law, but know your rights. So one more question before I bring Ricky Dillard in. Your husband, Pastor Remus Wright, talked about the church's social justice initiative. What is that? Well, we're working to educate our people. That is the first thing. Our church has always been politically active. We have several members of um, the a political community here in Houston in the state of Texas who are part of our, our church. We always, we provide voting information. We are a source of voter registration. I'm a registrar myself. All of us are very active and engaged in the political context, but we have not really moved so much in the social piece, social justice piece, really to say, are our people educated? If they're not educating them in the schools, then how do we give people the education that they need? They don't, our children no longer need to know and just get this history that black people were slaves and now they're free. Right. <laughs> and then I had a young lady who lived with me from another country and she asked me, she said, I don't understand if slavery was over in 1800s, why is it still a problem for black people in the United States? And I realized it's not just a problem for somebody out of there. It's a problem for somebody, you know, out of another country. It's a problem for our people. Our kids don't understand why is it. And we can't say the man is keeping us down. You know, there, there's terminology and there's words and we need to recognize it and understand what that is. So our goal is to educate our people so that if they are victims of racism, if they see racism, if they um, see bias occurring, that they would be able to speak to it and help educate others. And so we have a reading list of books that we'll soon be publishing, uh, a list of books that they could start out reading, how to begin a conversation with your coworkers about racism, how to not avoid that big elephant in the room. Because sometimes, you know, especially when we go back to our jobs, there's going to be a big elephant in the room. And how will you, how will you enter the conversation? and like, you know, not run, like, I hope they don't ask me nothing about this. 
because you need to be educated so you can talk about it. So that's our goal is really to, to help people be more aware, to help them be more engaged in the conversation and where the conversation needs to happen, start it. So whether it's in healthcare, if it's biases in economics, if it's biases in the judicial system or the policing system, our people need to be aware of what is the terminology we need to know and how do we speak forth to make changes. You are doing a great job equipping your over 24,000 members of the Fountain of Praise. Ricky Dillard, come on in here, Ricky. Let's get you into the conversation because you're down there in Atlanta. You're, you're a black man and you're watching all this. What is, what is your impression? First of all, welcome. What is, you. Your, what is your impression of what's going on today as far as social justice and the black church? It is disheartening uh, of some of the things that we've just been seeing in the last couple of months uh, toward black people and people of color and just the, the whole tone of racism and injustice and hatred and all of the things that we have endured. We thank God for our past as we have walked through so many valleys that the Lord has been with us through. And that is our strength to stand up to see what we are going through and to face it and to deal with it as we have been dealing with it for years and years and years. And I'm just glad that they finally see what we see. And it wasn't because they put it out there, it's because we put it out there. We have cameras, we have all of these things to help assist us in showing the injustices and inequality against people of color. And here in Atlanta and in DC, of course, you know, living in DC and Maryland area, you know, we're close to all of that. High <laughs> powers, <laughs> you know, uh, evil and high places, you know, all of that, we get a chance to see it firsthand and being there. But I'm thankful for what has been taught through time and Thank God for the African American Museum uh, that we were able to go and walk through our journey for those who put it together and funded it. It was one of the most amazing opportunities to yes. go there yes. and witness and see uh, paraphernalia from back then blocks of stone that people were sold on and just the whole story of our past and to see that we are still fighting. We are still fighting, but oh, we're about to be in our exodus and I feel it. I feel an exodus is about to take place and God is in front of it. There is hope. Uh, you spoke about the Smithsonian National, uh, Natural, uh, National Museum of African-American History. Uh, Lonnie Bunch III was the director of that museum. He is now in charge of the entire Smithsonian, all 16 museums in the complex. I think it's six, I think more than 16. Um, and he spoke recently about how all of these challenges, he sees hope through this, that we can definitely get through this. What amazed me, the awakening I had, Pastor Wright and, and Ricky Dillard, was that I've grown up and I looked at these Confederate monuments all my life and was always disturbed by it. Um, as a matter of fact, we didn't move, I didn't move my family to Virginia because I didn't want my children going to Robert E. Lee High School. <laughs> mm, mm, yeah. I kept going. Yes. All these years we've kept it in. Isn't isn't that it seems a little odd to me now? I, I don't know whether to be ashamed of that or you know, I don't know how to feel about the fact that now all of this is coming out. And why didn't we speak about it before? And if we did speak about it before, why nobody listened? Any comments? You know, um, I someone asked me why was like George Floyd's circumstance different? You know, we've seen and we've heard, we've watched other shootings, uh, police to, to black men, unarmed black men, but why was it different? And I've been kind of looking at different different thoughts and perspectives on that. But I think one of the things that we saw was, was the whole circumstance of COVID really caused us to be still, much more still than normal, right? And so mm. we cannot overlook what we see at this point because we have nowhere else to run and hide. You know, we can't say, well, I'm so busy. I don't see this doesn't affect me. But the thing that was different about this video was that we saw both men's faces. 
we saw both of their faces and witnessed the humanity, yes. right? One dehumanizing, gosh, can't get the word, dehumanizing the other one. I didn't say it right still, <laughs> but the other one crying out for mercy, you know, and yeah. it it made people see these are two human beings and one acting with such callousness and hatred. And so it kind of woke it up again. But I really applaud the efforts of these millennials and these Gen Z, Ys and Zs who are getting out here and they're saying, why have you all accepted it? I'm a Gen Xer, but why have you all accepted it? You know, it's like we've been fed bits and pieces. My mother came through civil rights. And so to see, you know, Brown versus Board of Education, her being able to go to a school if she wanted to go to a, a, a to an integrated school. You know, she so it was like, here's here, we're feeding you something here, and so be satisfied. And here, here's a civil rights, so you can vote now, be satisfied. And then yeah. for my generation, here's some affirmative action. So here, be satisfied. And so for some of us, we were satisfied and satisfied to the extent that you know, many of us moved out of the inner city, many of us saw our lives get you know come up, the income for you know, middle class blacks, all of that start to expand. It affected some of us, but it didn't affect the masses of us. And so now we still had, you know, uh, the policing, we had pipe to prison uh, from the school to prison pipeline happening. We see all these other things that still affect us. And it's affected us to the impact that this younger generation is saying, wait a minute, what's really going on? <laughs> so they have stood up to say, and, and it's it's <laughs> in the spirit of the, the Xers and, and the boomers to say, you're right, we've been silent too long. Yes. That's why I said yeah. I sat on Juneteenth for 30 years. My kids didn't know much about it. But yeah. now <laughs> I've been silent too long. You know, Absolutely. boom, wake up. Absolutely. Wake up. Thank God. Thank God. So it's not so, being very systematic at that point, too, that it was so normal. All of the statues, all of the policing, everything just seemed natural. It's just everyday living. But when you look at two different Americas. You're like, wait a minute, I thought we were all created equal. I thought we all were, this was the American dream that they seem to have that we weren't having. So I definitely piggyback on co-pastor's words. I feel it was very much systematic. It was embedded in the system of America through school mm -hmm. teachings, stuff left out about people of color. And I didn't, I didn't know who some of them statues were. I, didn't, I just thought they were just there. <laughs> until all of these things in the last few years have come out about who actually these men and uh, were of these statues. Right. I think it was a matter of our generation, the baby boomers, the Gen Xers, we were like, okay, yeah, that's racism. That's the way it is. We've seen it before. Yeah, yada, yada, yada. But the younger people are like, that's racism. It's not going to happen anymore. That's that's what's happening now, and and I appreciate them. I really do. So, Ricky, what, what does this mean to you as an artist, a gospel uh, music artist? Has it, it changed any uh, views about writing or any feelings or inspirations coming out of all that we're going through the COVID nineteen pandemic, losing so many valuable people because of this disease? and then the social injustice, everything happening at the same time? I, I think it is very um, important, uh, in, well, especially in my music, if you recognize when you came to our 10 recording, um, I did it on MLK Day at two o'clock in the afternoon in 2017, right before 45 was taking his seat as, and to be inaugurated. That recording was to speak to what we are going through, what's getting ready to go through with this new administration. Um, I just put songs on the project that will speak to what we were getting ready to walk in. If you notice, I played 13th, uh, Ava DuVernay's 13th. I played it before I came out on stage to record the 10 album, just to let people know and to let them see systematically some of the this injustices that have been done to us that we may not have been paid, been paying attention to. So I wanted to sing to that with songs like God is. Whatever we're getting ready to face, just know what he has done before. He can do it again. 
And I wanted to sing it through songs like uh, Consider It Done. No matter what blockings are going to come, what, what, what things are going to try to stop us and, and throw us off course, it is already done in him. So I wanted to, to record songs that encourage the last four years. Now I put out a new record. It's called The Choir Master. And on this project, the Holy Ghost just gave me songs to prep what was to come. I didn't know anything about a COVID coming down. I didn't know anything about police brutality was going to take a, 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 an attention to the world. So I just put songs that God gave me. And he gave me songs like, let there be peace on earth. Who would have ever thought that this song, which was written years ago and saying when we were kids, that it would be a song that would minister to many. The Lifter. There's so many people who have lost loved ones and friends through COVID. He is, I will lift up mine eyes to the hills from which cometh my help and knowing all my help comes from the Lord. He is the lifter of my head. It is so many songs that the Lord gave us on the Quiet Master album to sing to the now. And I trust and hope that every listener of this project will hear something that will speak to a situation within the times that we are now living in. The choir master. So so can we get that now or which is it oh, coming yeah. out? It's available on all social media, I mean on all platforms where you buy music, iTunes, all everywhere. You can get this choir master album. It is a phenomenal album. I thank the Lord that he used us to put it out. And it also is to kind of take me back, you know what I'm saying? In the last 10 years, you know, the CCM sound and the praise and worship has overwhelmed us. And that felt like the soul, the soul of who we are, the soul of what we have written in our experience and walk through time and life. Our ancestors and those who came before us, you know, we wrote songs that sang to our situations and our coming out and our coming through and God being with us and providing and being awake. These songs, just the whole heart and soul of the music. I wanted to kind of bring that back to the choir and put the choir back in the loft, which seemed to have been invisible in the last few years. Well, I see Robin Scott says, yes, sir. So I guess she's definitely going to go out and get the choir master. <laughs> Thank God. I, I want to ask you about, um, uh, you're a dynamic woman of God. You are co-pastor of your church with your husband. And lately I've been seeing a lot of first ladies becoming co-pastors. Are we witnessing an evolution of the woman in the black, black church? I think that, um, well, first, let me let me start by saying, Ricky, I'm about to download that right now. <laughs> um, and, and, and how music always has its pulse, its finger on the pulse of what is happening in our lives and in the world. Music always just, it, it reaches us in places that we can't articulate, but you can always think back to a song, right? So somebody says, oh, I remember my heart was broken in here. I remember so-and-so was playing this song, you know, and you can remember it. Music is such a critical part of our life. So I honor you for what you do and how you do it in the gifting that God has given you because you're an incredible, incredible uh, artist of God. So I thank God for you and all that you have given. Um, to, the, to the first ladies who have become pastor's wives, much like myself, um, I... Did not think that this would be a role for me. I didn't think I would be married to a preacher. God could not have given me this plan because I would have run, run, run. <laughs> <from it. laughs> so I still kind of laugh because I'm like, God, you still tricking me on stuff, right? You know, it's like <laughs> back to that DNA. What's in your DNA? What's in your purpose that God has created for you? Because I come from a lineage of preachers. My grandfather and my maternal side, a heritage preachers. I mean, the whole family, all my cousins, all the first cousins of the preachers and my grandfather's preacher and great uncles and such. And then on my father's side, great evangelists and missionaries in the seven day Adventist church. And so one of my aunts was one of the first missionary to India. Um, and so it, it's just incredible the the history that God has in your life. Sometimes you don't see it or recognize it and then God calls it forth. And so, uh, you know, for some people there you know, going along life in a different pathway and you're just thinking I'm here for the support. And then God says, no, you are 
<laughs> you're part of the support. You're here, you know, and I didn't just call you to be quiet. I called you to be a part of. And so right. I am, I'm always been, I'm a, very much a feminist. And so I've always questioned like why women can't do what, you know, women where the door shut yeah. for what reason? So I've always questioned many of those things. And I didn't become a, a female preacher because of that. I became a preacher because God called me. And then I remembered, oh, I'm a woman. Wait a minute. Am I supposed to be preaching? And I really struggled with this paradigm shift for me because back in 2000, so 1999, 2000, there were not a lot of women really serving in this capacity. There were a lot. Uh, but, you know, publicly in this capacity on this type of uh, stage or platform, it was not a whole lot. But I thank God for those who came before me, you know, for the Elaine Flakes, the Claudia Copeland's, the Cynthia Hales, you know, the uh, Joanne uh, Brownings, for all of them, Jessica uh, Ingram, all of them who, who, uh, who had laid a, a groundwork of breaking barriers for women to be able to do this, um, that I, I think it is a paradigm shift. But um, I will say this, when I was in seminary, a lot of my uh, pastoral friends would ask me, they would say, hey, could you call my wife? I like how you were called, God called you. Could you call, what do you mean call your wife? I don't call wives. I'm like, I don't call wives. God calls people. <laughs> so it was a play on words, but I think they just really wanted me to show some support because they would see that maybe their wife had a gift, but was not, you know, we're still struggling with what that gift could be in Christ, but everybody has their own personality. Everybody has their own calling and their gifting. Everybody has what God has given them as experience to bring to the table and how you use it is how you're accountable to God. And so um, if you're sitting there and asking yourself, is this something I should be doing? Pray and ask God, you know, show you if this is what he, he will have you to do. He'll order those steps so that you will know if I'm supposed to do it, let me do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so, yeah. so what is your what is your book unthinkable about? Oh wow, unthinkable is really to challenge your mindset. You know, um, we have what is called our metacognition, right? Our cognition is how we think. Metacognition is what we think about as we're thinking. So, our within our metacognition, many of us out talk ourselves out of stuff. So we outthink ourselves as if, if God says start a business, we're like, but I don't have any experience. I don't have the capital. I don't know how to do it. We, we get all the, I don't know. So if God says, you know, uh, go back to school, but I don't have the resources, but I don't know if I can make the time. We talk ourselves out of the things because we overthink ourselves. We overthink the things that we should be thinking. And, and we're not thinking with minds of faith. We're not thinking with the person, like a person that God could use, that God could expand your capacity, that he could put you in a place that you had no idea how the heck I get here, yeah, right? Well, and well. Rick, I mean, all of you guys are probably like me. You've been in some places and you look around and you're kind of like, really? Am I in this room? Me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Am I in this room with these people? How did I get here? And it's because God is intentional. And he wants to have you prepared to be in those spaces. And so stop thinking yourself out of those things. So unthinkable uses the woman uh, with the issue of blood. What that woman did that day when she decided that she would go out and touch Jesus as him. She had been sick for a long time. And she said, you know, following all these rules, doing what was right, going to the doctor, not being around nobody, all that stuff. She followed every rule. But that day she thought an unthinkable thought, if I could just touch. The rule said, don't touch. She said, if I could just touch him. You know, who does that, right? I'm following the rules. But, but what if I do touch him? If yeah. I do touch him, what can yeah. happen? Look I can be made whole. I can just yeah. change my whole life. I cannot just go back to normal, but I can have a new normal. So that's the goal with unthinkable. You preaching. Come you on, preaching. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, what is it that, so it's challenging your mindset. What is it that, you have said that I cannot do, that God cannot do. So let me challenge my right mindset and see how God can expand my capacity to do something that I did not think I could ever do. So it is- you know, it. it all ties back to what we were talking about. Did you ever think that you would see Confederate statues come tumbling down? Mm -mm. Come on now. Mm -mm. You Never. High level people talking about Black Lives Matter. Absolutely. I mean, so unthinkable is the book to get so that we can expand our minds and stop holding ourselves back by what we're thinking we can't do. Right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Get beyond yeah. that barrier of what is comfortable. Right. Yeah. Because we all have a zone of what we're used to, what we're accustomed to, what what we feel we can do to go beyond that. Yeah. You never know what you can do it until you try it.
right? Now faith. It's that now faith. Ricky, what made you decide you're gonna make a CD? I'm gonna I'm gonna record. I'm gonna take this yeah. fire and not just do you know Friday yeah. night musicals. I'm gonna record. Yeah. It took capital to do that, right? It took Absolutely. more than capital connections. It took things that yeah. you needed to make those things happen. But somebody could have talked you out of it, and you could have talked yourself out of it. Indeed, and some people tried to and told me I wasn't good enough. That, but okay. it was like I had must deceive faith. You know what I'm saying? If I just walk out there and do what he gave me. He'll add more to it while I'm out there. He'll add more to it. Then I, I didn't even know I was doing that or had that. It's that now faith to believe God for the impossible. And, yeah. and I'm going to get this book. I got to get this book, Co-Pastor. Yeah. Thank you, sir. It's on Amazon <laughs> and wherever you buy books. On the platform, yeah. I like what you said, on the platform that you buy books. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we're going we're gonna to get Unthinkable, the book by uh, past, Co-Pastor Mia Wright. And we're going to get yeah. The Quiet Pastor by Ricky Dillard. And so I, I want to give you an opportunity, uh, Pastor Wright, to shout out to your sorority, the AKAs, right? Yes, love to give a shout out to AKAs and the Links as well. They are two organizations that are doing great things in terms of aware awareness and how they're helping to build the community, helping with voters registration and helping to advance black people all in the world. And uh, not just the AKAs, all of the Greek letter organizations that are really educated black folks that are doing good things. So thank you all for all you do. That's right, all you AKAs, get your sister's book. And Ricky, who do you want to shout out to? Let me just, uh, just celebrate all of those who've been going through during this time, whether it is COVID, whether it is uh, social consciousness, uh, just being aware, just awakening, those of y'all just awakening. Listen, God is with us. He has always been with us. And if it's uncomfortable, it's all right. For whatever state I'm in, I've learned to be content and I'm learning how to move forward. I want to encourage everybody to hold on that he which hath begun a good work in you, he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. And everybody, thank you so much for joining us today. I want to remind everybody that the WHUR Community Response Line is always on call 202-308-7183. Uh, and just let us know how you feel. I'm hearing some really good comments coming from the community. And you can always go to whur.com to find out about how to fight COVID-19 and how to help your neighbors. Please listen to Sunday Afternoon Gospel with yours truly, Jackie Gales Webb, on Sundays from 12.15 until 2. And I'm going to turn back to Pastor Mia Wright and ask you, Pastor, if you can give us a benediction for our conversation. Oh, I love this. Thank you, Jackie, for having us both on. And we pray that God will bless each one of you that have listened into the conversation today, that you will be motivated and trusting in faith, but that God will do something in the season of life. Like as Ricky has said, that God has been here with us and now he is stirring up this peace within us. He's given us a mindset to work. He's given us the ability and the strength to work. And so now unto him who's able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we could ever ask, or think that ac according to the power at work in you, yeah. he is our wise God. He is the one and only Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Pastor Mia Wright and Ricky Dillard. God bless you and be safe, please. Thank you.